Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Pastor Tim. My Lord, that was powerful. Amen. That was absolutely excellent. You know, I, as a pastor, I go to God. I try to get the word for, for whatever God wants for your life. Okay, that's just the way the church, God established the church and that's the way it works. But it's just reminded me this morning how limited I am. How limited I am. Remember in, in the Old Testament particularly when God wanted to do something, it wasn't the apostles who went in first. It wasn't the apostles that led the way. It was the worship team, right? It was the Levites. They went first. They had to go and worship. They had to go and praise. And my God, that, I mean, you couldn't get a clearer example with Stephen and Simran and Sarah and Atanasio there and Emmanuel and Joshua <laughs> and Emerald just bringing that to us. So, so thank you guys. Thank you for being open to receive a word. Thank you for receiving that and then replicating that and pushing for us. Hallelujah. I mean, in Jesus, we can do this. We can do this. Amen? So praise God. We're going to continue what we began last week and push, like having a baby, <laughs> push into 2021. Push into whatever God has. I don't know how many years we've got left. Things seem to be winding up in history and in time. So all the more important to, to, for you to push forward and do whatever God has created you to do. Specific tasks, specific callings. Last week, we announced our theme for 2021. A year in which you will not limit God. Strange to even have to make a statement like that. But we saw how the conditioning of the UK and the conditioning within the nations of the world, the governments, are getting us accustomed to being restricted getting us accustomed to great limitations. And we just mentioned how it's really important that we don't carry that over to our Christian lives. That's not what we're called to do. I understand we have a pandemic, but I must not let this encroach on my faith and my belief. No way, absolutely no way. We saw how Joshua and Caleb are probably two of the Bible's best examples. Even after 40 years of lockdown and conditioning, they hadn't changed one jot. They still had full faith to take what was in 2021, to take what was coming up next year. And I pray that attitude in you and that attitude in me as we come to this crossover. We can limit God and we're going to take those limits off. God wanted to set them free and we saw in Psalm 78 and Psalm 68 he said you're limiting me. You are limiting me. And we saw how we do that by our image of him, by our self image and by the biggest thing of all really unbelief. Just not believing that he's good enough to do that for me. Good mean he sent his son to die for you. How much less are these things that we're believing for? How much less am I struggling with? Lord, will you open our eyes to that fact? How much more will he do great things? Great things. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the whole earth just looking for someone who will believe. Someone who will believe in his goodness. God, let that be you. God, let that be me. To believe him. Believe in him. You believed it for salvation. Keep on believing that. But believe it for great exploits. Great exploits. For his glory. For salvation. In these last days. Probably the biggest observation. Which came actually through the Wednesday prayer meeting. Powerful meeting a few weeks ago. When Pastor Pat was, was leading there. There was a lot of prophecy that night and um, one of the things that came through was that many Christians through lockdown have lost confidence. They were very confident people, even maybe cocky people. In 2018, man, you couldn't stop them. Couldn't stop them. They were moving at a pace. And then, wow, some, not everybody, but for some people, the lockdown... Their confidence has been shaken 
But for some people in lockdown, their confidence has been absolutely shattered. It's been shattered. It's been destroyed. Some people have gone into hiding. <laughs> They've gone into reverse. What's happening you? And thank God, some people have just blossomed. This has changed them so much for the positive. And their faith has increased. And thank God for that. This today, I want to talk about that issue of confidence. I, I've never studied it before, at least I've never studied it in the depth that I have this week. And it's been a complete eye-opener to me just how major a topic, how major it, an issue it is in Scripture. And I, I mean, how did I miss this? How did I not, how did I not see this? I, I can't believe it. Please don't take me the wrong way when I say this, right? This is a testimony. This is a personal testimony. And it's the truth. When I got saved, I almost immediately took off like a rocket. I mean, I was in full-time service so quickly. I had people offering me positions in this church, positions in that church. The, the, the fruit started to burst out of me. Everything I touched was, was just anointed and it was moving so fast so fast and it was it took I, at first i thought it was normal <laughs> but then that I, as i started to grow and know more and more pastors i would look at this pastor and look at that and it was so slow in comparison i would look and i would think well i mean it's taken him five years ten years and he's still you know so so little eff effective ministry in, in in his life why why did it move quick for me i never understood I never understood until this week. I just put the question behind me. I thought, well, we're all different. I'll just carry on, you know. I couldn't figure it out, so I just dropped it and moved on. And this week, for the first time, I thought, oh, I see. When I got saved, at the moment that I got saved, I was in a mess. And I had probably the lowest self-confidence that I've ever had in my life. I had come from a broken relationship. Losing that relationship made me feel bad, rejected, weak, a failure. And, and you know, it, it, it was a good time before that um, failure in relationship. Things have been going well. And I just got knocked back. And I'm telling you, I was below zero in self-confidence. I didn't have any. And so when I got saved, the obstacle of self-confidence didn't have to be removed in me because it wasn't there. I didn't have it. <laughs> and when I look, oh, I see. I had problems. I've still got problems. It's just this problem. This problem. Oh, yeah. Self-confidence is a ministry-limiting, miracle-stopping problem. I'll read it to you in multiple places this morning. Not confidence in God, but self-confidence. Listen to the Apostle Paul from Philippians chapter 3. Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision. We who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence. By the way, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever I had my confidence in, I lost it all. I lost, I lost my self-confidence. And he goes on to tell us how it happened. I was on the road to Damascus one day. You know, so cocky, so strong. This is Paul. This is Pharisee of Pharisees. Bright, shining Paul. And right there on that road, a brighter light came upon me. And in the brightness of Christ, I suddenly lost all of my confidence. 
Wow! And his life completely turned around. And it's just opened my eyes, the danger of self-confidence. Do you know it was necessary for Paul to lose his confidence, his self-confidence? It was necessary. He was so cocky, so strong. I mean, Pharisee of Pharisees, everything that he had been teaching with regards to the law, he was an expert in that. <laughs> and all of that was gone in one day. Imagine that. All of your learning, all of your expertise in Jewish law, it's all worth, well, not nothing, but it's all not important anymore because you're born again and righteousness is not by the law. So everything that his strength was in, everything his self-esteem came from, suddenly gone. Self-confidence gone. And look at what happened, Paul. It was necessary. The lockdown was necessary. Because I had to knock you off your high horse. I had to let you see the dimness of your light. That's what I had to let you see. I had you to, to, to really a wake-up call to the level that you're functioning at. I had to get your attention. Sorry about that. So let this lock, this is what my, my wife constantly, constantly prays this year. My God, let the lockdown do its work. Let it do its work. So many people have lost self-confidence and I think it was necessary. Certainly necessary in Paul. Not just Paul, it was necessary in the Apostle Peter. Remember how confident Peter was? Jesus, if everybody deserts you, you can rely on me. This, I, I will never do it. You can trust me with this. I'm different from the rest. Peter had massive self-confidence. And yet, that same day, he betrayed Jesus three times, and suddenly there's his light. There's his road to Damascus. And he's in a doorway, and he's broken. And he's thinking to himself, Who am I? What was my confidence in anyway? It was necessary for the Apostle Paul to lose his self-confidence it was necessary for the apostle peter to get a grip on who he actually was and by the way let me say this particularly in today's society there are many people who exude confidence but they've got no competence <laughs> you can go to school, you know courses and colleges and schools and they'll teach you how to be more confident it's very very popular very especially in north america I, I ministered in north america for years all over the different states in america and i tell you that is one nation who they love confident people they love that but after in the beginning i thought wow these people are all super confident but after a while you soon realize they may look confident but they may not have any competence at all it can all just be a facade so be very careful, guys. Be very careful. It can be completely fake. and can be very human, as it was with Peter. He, he, he wasn't faithful at all. Very human self-reliance. So today, in our second look at No Limits 2021, today I don't want to give you more self-confidence. <laughs> today I don't want to restore your self-confidence. I want to destroy it. I want to obliterate it. I want to do to you what Jesus did to Paul. I want to shine a light on you and show you who you are that you might perceive him. And I want to change the focus of your confidence to him and not to you. It should never be on you anyway. Paul in Philippians there, he complains about those mutilators of the flesh, those dogs, because they were people they come to Christ, but they want to keep some outward presentations. They wanted to keep circumcision. So all new believers, they have to be circumcised. You know, every Christian. This, and Paul is very angry at them. They, they, they wanted part of their confidence to get part of their confidence from the outward display. That's what they wanted. Something physical, something I can show. The razzmatazz, whatever it might be. The pomp and circumstance of church. The recognition I get when I come on Sunday and everybody knows me. The confidence I can have in that. No good. No good. 
So Paul rages against this. He understands the danger of circumcision. That's an outward mark. That's an outward thing in which you're putting trust. And I'm warning you, stay away from it. So today I pray that God smashes my comfort zone, my confidence zone in myself and just reorient, reroutes me towards him. I was hosting a pastor's meeting yesterday for European churches <coughs> and I, it, I've been doing that for years and years and years. Very confident in that ministry, confident in that role. It's no problem to me. It's a normal day at work for me. About three years ago, because I'm interested in mental health, my own mental health, keeping myself mentally strong, and I like to help people, I was in that area of work for a while. So about four years ago, I signed up for a course, a mental health course called CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, here in London. And I went along to the opening night and there was about 32, I think it was something like that, professionals in the room. And they, everybody had to introduce themselves. So this person's a psychiatrist, this person's a psychologist, this person's a clinical psychologist, mental health professionals all around the room. And then they started to talk their, lang their lingo. Well, it was total gobbledygook to me. I couldn't understand anything they were saying. None of the terminologies. And I'd gone from being very comfortable in my role and suddenly I don't know if you've been in this position recently suddenly I was taken out like the Apostle Paul being taken out of Judaism and put in Christianity I don't know this stuff and I've been taken out of Christianity the church where I've spent my life and put in amongst of these professionals of mental health and I was totally out to sea totally lost it was a great experience, you know, a little bit scary, but a great experience. Mary's, my wife, is, is, is an expert in linguistics. She teaches Spanish and communication at university level. And you can imagine that in her culture, in her country, this is what she knows. You can get a lot of confidence with that. But thank God, he's the always God, always God. He takes her out of a Spanish-speaking country, out of her, brings her to a country where she doesn't speak the language. Now, now where's your expertise? Now where's your confidence going to come? Are you getting the picture? God has a master plan here. He has a master plan to try and get us God-word focused. Three simple points this morning. My first point, <coughs> to my surprise this week, new again to me, the Bible has a very great deal to say about confidence. I, I, I never saw that so clearly. Particularly the apostles, those who were closest to Jesus, constantly advised. We just read Paul, right? And what Paul's strong advice, be careful of how you operate in your confidence. But also the apostle John, in 1 John, three times, I'll read it to you. 1 John chapter 1, uh, 1 John chapter 2. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence. Who's talking about confidence? Confidence before him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Towards God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. Are you getting the picture? Paul is moving from his self-confidence. It's been shaken, maybe shattered. And he's moved to a confidence that I have not yet experienced in my life. The Apostle John has obviously had the same experience. And he's trying to bring the church with him. In fact, I did a study in 1 John this week. John mentions really, in, in, in my terms, paraphrasing John, but he mentions four types of confidence. Self-confidence, overconfidence, confidence in people, and then God-confidence. And we need to get a grip on how we operate in all four of those areas so that we can get this thing right. Self-confidence, I think, is the one that we're most familiar with. This was exemplified in Lucifer. Lucifer, the most beautiful thing that God has created. Music was in him. Imagine that. So when Lucifer moved, it was like orchestras played. He was moving music. 
incredible creature, the most beautiful thing that God had ever created. But self-confidence, pride, if you like, kicked in. And in Isaiah, God speaks to him. You have said, this is God speaking to Lucifer, you have said in your heart, I will, here's the confidence, here's the self-confidence, I will ascend on heaven, I will exalt my throne over the stars, I will also sit on uh, uh, the mount of the congregation, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. And then it says, but pride has been found in you, so he cast him down to the earth, changed his name, and he became Satan, the devil, fallen angel. Self-confidence has a dangerous origin and can take you to dangerous places. Paul's right, huh? John is right. Then there's overconfidence. Another apostle, the apostle James. James speaks about being overconfident. Come now, you who say, tomorrow I'm going to go to this city or I'm going to go to that city. Tomorrow I'm going to buy and sell and I'm going to make money and I'm going to make profit. Woe to you who think such ways or say such things because you do not know. How true is that? You do not know if you're going to be allowed to travel. (laughs) Right? So true. So I see this problem being worked out by Paul. Being worked out by Peter. Being worked out by James. Being worked out by John. So how on earth did I miss it? How on earth did I miss it all these years? To see it for what it, what it actually is. God, would you deliver me from self-confidence in Jesus' name? I don't want it. Deliver me from over being overly confident. And forgive me, uh, f- deliver me from confidence in people. There's countless examples of that. I'm sure you have had plenty that you could testify. And the Apostle Paul ultimately brings us in virtually all his letters... Apostle Paul, when you read it correctly, is talking to us about, hey guys, get your confidence in God and God alone. He puts it like this, every single letter, every letter, all 13 letters of the Apostle Paul, either they begin or he repeats through or he ends with these words, may the grace of God be unto you. May the grace of God reach you. He's he's explaining to them, don't rely on yourself. Don't rely on your works. Don't rely on your strength. Don't you know that everything is off the grace of God? And what a change we see in him. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says this. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Wow. There's a change. There's a big, big change. Not Hebrew of Hebrew. Not Pharisee of Pharisees. No. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And also by the grace of God, he realized that's how he was able even to serve God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, it says this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, (laughs) confidence in God cannot be shaken. You can be shaken. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we serve God. You serve, if you serve God, and many of you do, you do so not because of your works. You do so by grace and through grace. Praise God for that. That's my first point. Confidence, self-confidence is a big issue with the apostles. They all had to overcome it. And then they all advise us, hey, hey, yo-ho, watch this. Be careful. Have you seen this? No, I had not never seen this before. Never seen this before until this week. And it's been quite a shock to me. The second thing, in connection with no limits. When we have confidence in ourselves, I mean, is that limited or what? (laughs) Very limited. You're limited. You're so limited. All of us together are so limited. The human race together is so limited limitations but if I can just get my confidence into God that's where the unlimitedness lies great example of this in Matthew's gospel the feeding of the 5,000 I really felt there was a word here this week for you so listen up with this I'm going to read it 
When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. And hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them and he healed the sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We only have five loaves. Limitation. We only have five loaves and, and, and two fish, they answered. And listen to what Jesus says. Give it to me. Give it. Is that your limitation? Is that, what, is that all you can do? Give it to me then. Because you're not going to do anything with it anyway. It's not going to work anyway. Give me your limitation. Bring them to me, he said. And then Jesus directed the people to sit down on the grass. And Jesus took the human limitation, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And look at this. And looking up to heaven, where is his confidence? Where is the confidence of Jesus? Looking up to heaven. And the Greek word, <coughs> some of you will be aware of this. The Greek word, <coughs> excuse me, is anablipo. When it says look, that Jesus looked, it doesn't mean he looked. It means he received, actually. The exact same word is used when blind people receive sight. When someone is blind, they are anablipod when they're healed. They receive sight. So when it says they had the problem, and it, this is what's happening. Big problem. Big problem. We've got to feed the crowd. Okay, disciples, what can you do? Option A, send them away. Option B, go to the villages and buy some food. Option three, take up an offering. None of these are any good. So Jesus then steps in and says, I'm going to show you another option. Anablipo! Look unto God. And what happened? An unlimited supply. They had to almost stop the miracle. They fed everybody and there was 12 baskets left over. And that would have just kept on going. Praise God. I pray today that you, whatever we're all limited, we're human beings. But God is not. And don't be afraid of that limitation. Instead, use it and give it to God, just like they had to do here. Give it to me. Give it to me. He has the power, the ability, and the will to bless your future. Have confidence in the sovereignty of God over your life. I know this has been a tough year and is still a tough time for many people. I understand that. I get it. But I want to say to you, restore your confidence in the sovereignty of God. Even after 40 years in the wilderness, Joshua and Caleb, all that suffering, they still believed God is in this. When Joseph was in prison for 14 years, God is still with me. God is still with me. I still believe, even in the storm, I still believe in his sovereignty. When Abraham was lifting up the knife, and going to sacrifice Isaac. Remember his words. He believed in the sovereignty of God. Even if this child dies, I believe, I have confidence that either he will come back physically or he will come back metaphorically in the next life, but he will come back. Great, great confidence. And I pray in these troubled times around the world that you restore your confidence that God is with you. Correct, Sarah? Amen. God is with me. I just got to keep walking. Got to put one foot in front of the other and we'll get there. Restore your faith, even with the bumps, in the sovereignty of Almighty God. Restore your faith that your service for God, it's you who's limiting that. <laughs> You're limiting yourself. When God, there's no limitations. When those disciples gave it to Jesus... I mean, he just proved the point. He multiplied it everywhere. Next, it's everywhere. There's bread everywhere. Bread everywhere. Have, restore your faith, your, your confidence in God for your ministry. Are you listening to me? <coughs> Paul had his confidence in his experience, in his past, and he had to take that and put it into God. Give it up to God. Put your confidence for 2021 
in a God who can limitlessly bless you in service. Can you imagine, I was thinking this morning about Joshua. Joshua knew that he was on a commission by God. He was going into battle, but the sun was going down. Remember that? Sun is going down. How much confidence must that man have had in God? I mean, he turns and he says, I don't want the sun to go down. Hang on a minute. Sun, stand still. Sun, stand still over the valley of Ajalon. My Lord, that's confidence. That's confidence in your ministry. This man had a ministry. And he believed it was from God. Where did you get your ministry? Who called you? Well, he who called you will also multiply that thing. But you can't hold it to yourself. You know, Paul probably started out not very confident. But as the years went by and he developed skills, he probably became more self-confident. Some of you have been ministry a long time. Stephen, you've been singing for years. You can do this. You can just do this. And there's a certain danger there, right? There's a danger there. And even though I spend years in ministry, even though you spend years as a worship leader, as a pastor, or whatever your ministry is, don't let that be the source of your confidence. Don't, don't look that way. Don't do it. Look up onto God and keep your confidence in Him. And my final, my final point. I confess that I was limiting God in 2020 in ways that I was totally unaware of. <coughs> and I reiterate my dream and my hope. In 2021, I am going to intentionally stop trusting myself as such, intentionally make sure I'm not putting faith in myself. I've been doing it this morning in here. It's just breaking me. Lord, I lean on you. God, I trust in you. The chief of all sinners. That's how Paul had come to see himself. And so the world opened up for Paul. Opened up for John. Opened up for James. And it will open up for you too. We haven't had an altar call in a long time. Because we're all in different places. But if I was going to have an altar call, this would be my altar call today. This is what I'm about to say now. The little boy just had his lunch. That's all he had. This is what I can do. This is what I can do. I can bring five loaves and two fish. This is it. And Jesus says, <laughs> just give it to me. Just give it. You can go and work on that if you want, but that's very limited. Very limited. You'd be better off just giving that to me, you know, and putting your trust in me instead of that. And I want to address three things in you that I want you to give to God right now, today. The first one is control. Keeping control. Not easy, you know, giving up control. Not easy, not easy at all. We like to have a certain, you know, security in our life, don't we? And God doesn't like that because that can lead to self-confidence. And He constantly requires us. He shakes up our comfort zone so that our faith has to be put back into him. But there's an easier way, you know. I can just give it up voluntarily now. Father, I surrender control. I think a great example of this is in Mary, the mother of Jesus. Great embarrassment, family embarrassment, the great wedding and it's her responsibility partly to provide for this, the, the bread, the food, and the wine. And in a Jewish wedding, that's really important. And it's all finished. So the servants, it looks like to me, the servants are pushing Mary. Go and talk to Jesus. Go and tell him to do something. He can do this. So Mary goes, hey, Jesus, answer this. And he says, no, my, my time has not yet come. And I can imagine those servants, ask him again. Put pressure on him. Control him. Manipulate him. Dominate him. And look at the response of Mary. No. Nope. And she simply silences the servants. Whatever he says. No control with Mary. Whatever he says, that's what we do. Don't you just love that? <laughs> oh, wonderful. Giving up the total surrender. 
So I ask you, who are you trying to control? That's not good. It's the Holy Spirit's job. Who or what are you trying to control? Give it up. Give it up. Just give it up. Give Hand the controls over to God. Jesus said, I do nothing. I do nothing other than what the Father, I see, and a bleepo, I see the Father do. That's all I do. And he had the ability, right, to do many things, and he chose not to. I'm totally submitted. First thing in closing today, give up control. The second thing is about money, finances. Never been a bigger issue because of 2020. Many people have lost and lost and lost, and then when they thought they'd lost everything, they lost even more. Business is going bankrupt. Even those who, who are super smart at making money have been losing money in 2020. And I don't know if God could make his point any more in, emphatic than it already is. You know, the Apostle Peter was a good businessman. He knew exactly what he was doing in his fishing business, etc. And he's out on, you remember, he was out in the boat. And he's doing everything he knows to do. In fact, he was working all night. All year 2020. Worked all night. But somehow it's just not working anymore. This, this business is not working. Not working. Didn't catch anything. And then Jesus walks along. And says, <clears throat> Peter, there's another way, you know. I know you've got skills. I know you're a qualified super fisherman. I know, I know. But I've just stopped that a moment. I just prevented you tonight. Because I want to give you another option. Would you obey me? Just obey me and listen. And Peter, yes, 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 Lord, whatever you say. Okay, cast those nets on the earth. Just do what I say. Okay, guys, get the nets. There's no point. Put the nets on the earth. Do whatever he says. Just do whatever he says. Not only was Peter's boat filled with fish, the assistant boat was filled with fish, and if they'd had more boats, they would have been filled with fish. Unlimited! Unlimited! As soon as God comes in, the limits come off. We're causing the limits. And God can bless you financially like he's done millions of people before you if you will just let him in. Look at the woman with the, with the oil starving to death. And because she gives what she had left, a little bit of oil, a little bit of flour, and Elijah there represents Jesus, and she gives it to Jesus. Look at the result. Every jar that you bring, I will fill. And if she'd had double the number of jars, double the number of jars would have been filled. Unlimited. As we come to the end of the year, I want to give over control I want to work at it intentionally. I can see these apostles doing that. They were working at it. <coughs> they became aware of it. Like I've done this week and I hope you do this morning. I've become aware of my reliance to some degree on, my, on myself. And I want to get that out in Jesus' name. I'm not going to control things. I'm going to trust the Lord and the Holy Spirit and just obey the word no matter what the situation. I won't be tempted in that way. For my finances, if I give it to God, scripture and history proves he's so keen to come back into my life. And the last thing is my future. Just giving up my future. I wonder, Stephen and Simran, we sang... A song, I give myself away. Any chance you could sing that again? We can't have an altar call, folks, but today is too serious a moment, too serious a day just maybe to rush on. I know we've got a couple of other things to do. But I'm going to put myself out on mute. And as Stephen and Simran sing this song, I want you to give away control. Give away your lunch. The bread and the fish, give it away. Give away like the widow did. Give away your last, the oil and the flour. Give it away. Give away your, your, your self-confidence and receive a newfound confidence in God. Follow the example of the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, the Apostle James, who all learned this lesson. 
And may God bless you more than ever in 2021. Stephen's going to sing this through once. I want you to commit your own prayers. And when he finishes, Pastor Timothy, I will hand back to you. Thank you, Stephen.